Profit pens out. Anyone need to borrow a pen? We good? Come on, bro. Come on, Jason. Amen, guys. Well, let's start with the word of prayer. Amen. Father, we're so grateful for this day. We're so grateful to be at church this morning, God, as sold out disciples of Christ. Yes. God, we're so grateful to truly be in your cathedral, yes. in your creation, understanding that you created the air that we feel right now. Yes. The trees that are hovering over us, Father. The oxygen in our lungs, God. We pray that you move us aside right now. That anything in our hearts, Father, we don't just throw it out the door, Father, but we give it to you to heal, God, Amen. and to fix. Please, God. God, please move me out of the way, Father. Amen. An insecure 26-year-old, that's a sinful man. And allow us not to hear my voice, God, but allow us to truly hear the voice of Jehovah God. Amen. God, we're so excited to get in your word. Please be with this time. We just give everything in your hands, and we're so excited to truly walk away change and truly be warriors for Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Well, greetings from Dallas, Fort Worth. <laughs> or as we say in Texas, howdy, y'all. I've been there for two years now, so I can say howdy. You know, it's been incredible being in Portland, Oregon for the 2017 Pacific Northwest Campus Retreat, Warriors for Christ. And guys, has this not been an incredible retreat so far? Yeah, yeah bro. It's, this has been mind-blowingly awesome. I mean, the sermons have been incredible. The food's been incredible. George has done an incredible job planning everything out, amen? You know, I definitely want to thank the parlors and the Moans and the cars for having us down. Thank you guys so much for allowing us to share in this time with you guys, allowing us to speak, for rolling out the red carpet for us, bringing us camping, Caesar and Debbie for taking care of us and bringing us in your home, for, for feeding us. Uh, we're truly so grateful. We're inspired by all the miracles going on here in the Pacific Northwest. You know, before we get started, I have a question for you. Do we have any warriors in the house? I don't know if you heard me. Do we have any warriors for Christ in the house? Let's be honest. When the world thinks of warriors, when the world thinks of Jesus, they don't think of warrior. When the world thinks of Jesus, they think of a Ned Flanders Christianity. That's true. They think of a pasty, white-skinned, weak-skilled man holding a lamb and singing a kumbaya around the campfire. That's true. They think of a wimp. That's true. But I want to convince you today that Jesus is the mightiest warrior in history. Come on. The title of our closing lesson to end out our campus retreats is Jesus, the Warrior of warriors. Nice. You know, in John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Therefore, wherever we read about the Father in the scriptures, we're also reading about the Son. Yeah, Hope you enjoyed that nugget. <laughs> nice one. Yum. Therefore, in Exodus 14, 14, the Bible says, the Lord will fight for you. You all need to be still. We understand Jesus is a warrior. Amen. In Exodus 15, verse 3, it says, The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. In Isaiah 42, 13, The Lord will march out like a champion. Like a warrior, he will stir up his zeal. Are we zealous for God this morning? Woo! With a shout, he will raise the battle cry, and we will triumph over his enemies. In Jeremiah 20, verse 11, it says, But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. Zephaniah, Zephaniah 3, 17, it says, The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. And my personal favorite in Revelation 19, 11 through 16, you see the Apostle John tell us about the resurrected, reincarnate Jesus Christ riding on a white horse, which represents victory with a sword in his hands, leading the armies of God. 
we understand Jesus Christ is the greatest warrior in history. Come on. Turn with me over to Mark chapter 1. And we'll begin our study on the warrior of warriors. Come on. And our goal today is not to learn some cool insights about Jesus. To walk away from the retreat fired up. Ready to, go. to walk away from the retreat <laughs> all full of the all ready to take on the world. Come on, Woo! Ready to go. But to walk away making true decisions nice. yeah, that's right. that are going to affect the rest of your life. To truly be like the warrior of warriors. Come on. To go back to your campus, mm -hmm. to preach the word, and to change our campuses in this generation for Christ. Yeah. In order to become like the warrior of warriors, we need to learn a few things, amen? amen. Our first point today, the warrior of warriors had radical proclamation. Here in Mark chapter 1, we see in verse 9, Jesus was baptized by John. Now, there's no such thing as a boring baptism. That's right. But Jesus, this was pretty awesome. Personally, it was my second favorite. Jesus is first, or rather, it's my, my first favorite. Amen. Jesus, then mine. <laughs> but as he was baptized, he goes in the water. The clouds of heaven are torn open. And God says, this is my son. Who am I am pleased? Listen to him. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. When Jesus was baptized, God said, hey, this is my son. Wow. You know what's cool? When you were baptized into Christ, you became God's son and you became God's daughter. Wow. Therefore, as we sit together today, we understand that we're not just random churchgoers. We're truly a family. Yeah. Of course, right after he was baptized, he was sent by the Spirit of God to be tempted by the devil for 40 days in the desert. And we pick it up here in verse 14. The Bible reads, after John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. We see here the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and Isaac Mark. And what's the first thing we see here? In verse 14 it says, after John was put in prison. Well, I like to get a little interactive here. Who is John? Baptist. John, he was a Baptist. <laughs> right? John the Baptist. And it's Jesus' cousin. Wow. Jesus' his family. So what do we see here? Jesus found out that his family member was put in jail and condemned to death. Wow. Condemned to die. Now, what's the temptation there? Could you imagine if you got a call today and you heard a family member was going to be murdered? A family member was going to be killed. Like that's heavy. We read that just like passing and all these studies like, well, that's intense. His family member was going to die. What's the temptation there? Man, I want to give up. I want to go home. I, you know, what, what if I just take the rest of today off, take it easy for a few days? I mean, do I really need to be this committed to the cause? There's hard times going on right now. Yeah. Mm. Nice, good point. But what do we see? He preached the word of God. Yeah. I want to persuade you of something this morning. All hardship is from God. God either forces it, he either makes it happen in your life, or he allows it to happen in your life. I think as disciples, sometimes we can kind of have a funny attitude towards hardship. And we start to think hard times happen. Whoa, whoa, hey, 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 hey. Yeah. What is this? This isn't what I signed up for when I counted the cost. My life was going to be easy now. I'm a disciple of Jesus. Hard times. I need a break. I need to, this is not, the world was just so much easier. And we start to get jaded when hardship starts to come there. And we start to get this mindset where we're searching for a prosperity gospel. Wow, you know, that's big in Texas. You have the Joel Olstein Christianities. Oh, yeah. 
and they talk about how you get that big white house and the two car garage with the bob picket fence you get that boat in the driveway you get a big old truck you get yourself a pretty wife you get a nice paycheck and you go to you gotta be fully committed you just be a little bit committed you love the lord with all your heart and it is the prosperity gospel do you want your life in order but we understand that is the flat most wicked thing that's sending people to hell. See, in order to understand hardship, in order to understand suffering, we need to take a deeper look in the scriptures. You see, the Old Testament is a physical foreshadowing of the spiritual realities we have in New Testament times. Amen? Amen. So everything happened in the Old Testament in order to help us understand what's going in our lives today, yeah. spiritually speaking. Yeah. So let's work together here, amen? So the Israelites went into slavery in Egypt. If you're not a, a church leader, what does that represent? What do you guys think? Raise your hand. Slavery. The Jews in slavery, amen? And that represents us in slavery in sin. Then what happened next? They crossed the Red Sea. What does that mean? What do you got, bro? Baptism. Baptism, that's right. And then you got 40 years in the desert. You got it. The disciple life. Great job, sis. Then you got the, you know the Jordan River song? Jordan River. What is the Jordan River? Death. Death. And the promised land? Heaven, amen. Too many of us were expecting to go straight in the promised lands. We want a prosperity gospel. God forbid hardship comes. This isn't the promised lands. Jesus didn't give you the promised land yet. He gave you 40 years of suffering. It's time to enjoy it. See, we need to make sure that we're not wasting our suffering. To not avoid suffering. But God gives us suffering to train us and make us more mature warriors for Christ. You know, in the midst of this hardship, he preaches the word and he finds these fishermen. It's super deep insight for you. What do fishermen do? They catch fish, amen? That one's free. So he finds these fishermen who fish and he calls these men to a radical decision. He says, guys, I want you to give up everything for God. Yep. Come on, bro. I want to call you to a new purpose. You're no longer going to catch those stinky fish. Amen. You're going to put those nets down. You're going to walk away from your family for now. And you're going to come and transform the lives of men and women. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did. You see, when you call someone to something great, that's when great things begin to happen. When you call someone to do great changes, that's when great changes start to occur. Absolutely. At times we get nervous to, to call people to greatness, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You're in a discipleship study and you show them Luke 14, verse 33. <laughs> if anyone wants to be a disciple, they must give up everything. What does everything mean? Everything, everything. everything right? But we get in those studies sometimes and we get kind of nervous. Do you, do you maybe want to kind of sort of give up I, I know it's so hard it's a really big commitment it's a lot of changes do you want to sort of maybe kind of do and we try to like like finagle people into the kingdom right. yeah. come on jason guys we can't hesitate to call people to greatness come on, bro. good point why because you're not calling them to follow you come on, bro. we're calling them to follow jesus it's time to call people to greatness. Come on, bro. And it's not hard. You know what's hard? Picking up the cross. <laughs> you tell me, you know what's awesome? You get to give up everything, but Jesus got to die for you. Yeah. So unless you want to switch places with Jesus, I would just give up everything. <laughs> it's much easier. <laughs> you know, when I think of calling people to greatness, I think of our Crown of Thorns project Amen. and movements. Yes. Yes. Isn't it inspiring to think of all the churches that have been planted in the last years? Yes. Yeah. 
You know, in 2013, I had the honor of being on the, the church to Sydney, Australia, the church plant. Wow. Amen. Wow. Got to go down there with the kangaroos. <laughs> Believe it or not, we went to the other side of the earth, but we didn't fall off. <laughs> Gravity. It's really cool. <laughs> Talk about hardship. We, we went to bring the gospel to one of the richest countries of the world full of atheists. The first day we got there, we're like, fine, we were on stage at the, uh, the uh, congregational church service, and everyone's shouting, and we did a haka for everyone, and the, the Sydney men, and they gave us globes, and we had, had, had uh, sit, uh, Australia capes on, we had war paint in their face, we were warriors for God in Australia, and then we get off the plane, and we start sharing our faith, and like 15 minutes into sharing our faith, this guy's like, what are you doing here? Go back to your country! Oh man, this is kind of hard. This kind of hard. <laughs> Tell us. And for three months, we had no baptisms. It was one of the most trying and hard times in my life. Joel knows. I called him crying on the phone multiple times. I wanted to give up. But we persevered, and after three months of fighting for God, after three months of fighting to get our hearts right with God, fighting to get surrendered, we had our first baptism. <laughs> Her name was Tegan. It was awesome. It was actually raining the day we baptized her. Raining represents new beginnings. It was a new beginning for Australia. Amen. Just like today, man. It's a new beginning for our walk with God. After a while, we had more growth. And then a sister, Anisha, reached out to this young Chinese girl named Maggie. And we had our first Chinese disciple. Wow. Maggie was coming around. And she's like, hey. I'm so grateful for my walk with God. Sure, there's hardship going on, but I want to radically proclaim the gospel as well, just like you did to me, Renisha. She says, hey, I have a friend named Dean. <laughs> I'm going to invite Dean to church. <laughs> Dean comes on out to church. This guy is incredible. We instantly become friends. We're watching Netflix together. We're cooking <laughs> spaghetti together. We're talking about our lives. And then I found out he's an atheist. What do you do? <laughs> but he loved the fellowship so much, he kept coming around. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word. What do you do? You preach the word of God to him. His heart started to change. I remember the first time praying with him. We we did a bunch of Bible studies, and then we were out by this lake, this university called Macquarie University. And we're out by, by the lake at the school, and I pray first. He just starts laughing, like, we're, we're talking to the air. What are we doing? Like, this is so silly. Like, Dean, just trust me. Just do it. Just believe it. And eventually, your heart's going to change. And I remember just the process of Dean's heart slowly changing. To see him go from this, like, goofy young, young kid to this young man of God. I remember the day he was baptized. It was a tsunami baptism. It was intense. It wasn't really a tsunami, man. <laughs> but the waves were so big, I literally thought I was going to get fired for picking that beach out. <laughs> like, literally, we get in the water. <laughs> Dean starts getting carried out to the ocean. <laughs> we baptized this Chinese guy, or this uh, big Australian guy the week before that saved all our lives, literally, like, carried us one by one. <laughs> 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 then we, the video is somewhere on Facebook. If you go back far enough, I'm going to look for it. But Dean was baptized into Christ. Yeah. Before he's baptized, though, it's always good to count the cost. Yeah. That's true. So Joe Willis, the church leader, sits down and says, Dean, it's time to count the cost. Here's your cost. You need to be willing to give up Australia. You need to be willing to go back to Hong Kong on the mission team. And you're like, all right, cool, I can handle that. That was challenging for Dean. That was, like, nearly impossible. Because Dean had developed the Chinese dream of the Australian dream. It's like the American dream, but in Australia. You move to Australia from China. You, make, you get a degree. You make lots of money. You marry an Australian woman, and you stay there the rest of your life and live comfortable and happy. Dean's down for a few days. Man, like, my parents have given up everything so I could be here. I've worked so hard for this. This is so hard. And he was 
down for a few days. But he prayed, he fasted, we prayed, we fasted, and he was baptized into Christ at the tsunami baptism. Yeah. Dean says, I want to give up my dream so I can live God's dream. And now he wasn't only on the Hong Kong mission team, but at this year's GLC, he was appointed as an evangelist in the kingdom of God. How did that happen? How is he having such radical proclamation from atheist to evangelist? Because he had vision from God to save his people. And not just in Hong Kong, but all of mainland China and all of Asia. I had a question. Do you have vision for how God's going to multiply your campus ministry? Come on, Jason. Do you have vision for how God's going to multiply your Bible talk? Do you have vision how God's going to multiply you? We need to understand. It's not man who put you on the campus you're at. It's not man who put you in your Bible talk, but it's the Lord. Come on, Jason. And he put you there for one reason, to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Amen. We need to have vision for Shoreline City College. Yeah. For the University of Washington. Yeah. For PCC Central Salvania, Salvania amen. Yeah. For George Fox University. Yeah. For PCC Rock Creek. Do I hear Lane University or Lane CC? Yeah. How about the University of Oregon? Yeah. Northwest Christian College. Yeah. Oregon State University. Yeah. And do we have any PSU in the house? Yeah. You know, in Proverbs 29 verse 18 in the King James Version, it says where no vision, the people perish. Therefore, if you fail to be a man or a woman of vision, you fail to be someone who's going to make radical proclamation like a warrior for Christ. You know, I appreciate George. I learned about his, his weekly D times with himself. And he sits down, and they're not discipling times. They're called dream times. And he sat there, he said, bro, I just sit there, whether if I'm working out or whatever I'm doing, and I just dream how God's going to move. I like to think about when we talk about church, this church planted, this church planted, this church, send out this leader, and I say, whoa. I'm here right now. What if we baptize this many people and send out this group and do this and do this and then we'll do this and this is going to be incredible. <coughs> George is a man who has great vision. Yeah. Go. I want to challenge you to have vision to see your Bible talk double by the end of this year. Wow, come on. For your Bible, maybe you didn't hear me. I want to challenge you for your Bible talk to double come on. Yeah. by the end of this year. Three things that's going to take. Number one, it's for every one of you adopting that vision today. Amen. Not just, the, hey, bro, I'm not a Bible talk leader. It doesn't matter. It's your responsibility. Yes. Nice. Wow. Wow. It, it's not your Bible talk leader. It's not Joel who's going to evangelize the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> he can't do that on his own. It's not Caesar or Brian. It's not your Bible talk leader. It's you. Come on, Jason. And if you don't adopt that vision, don't go home because wow. it's not going to work. Wow. Good point. We need to adopt the vision, make it personal today. Amen. Secondly, you got to get a dream to be a Bible talk leader. Amen. Bro, I don't, I don't know if that's my calling there. Well, amen. Did Jesus die for you? Then it's your calling. Come on, Eric. What does it mean to be a Bible talk leader? To teach someone the elementary truths of God's word. To show them how to see God effectively. How to make the word their standard how to be a sold out disciple, how to teach them what the kingdom of God is. It's not the art of a study. You can memorize it too, amen? amen. <laughs> teach them how to go from the darkness into the light. Come on, Jason. Teach them about the cross. Teach them that the only way to be saved is to be a true disciple. Amen. It's time to dream to be leaders. Amen. And number three, as a Bible talk leader, you got to keep the dream alive. alive. Don't be a leader who doesn't lead. Don't be a leader who leads from the back. Be a leader with a dream and with a vision. It's time to be men and women with vision and truly produce radical proclamation. Now, if we want to be warriors for Christ, yes, we need radical proclamation. But we also need point number two, 
daily preparation. Awesome. And Mark chapter 1, look down at verse 35. This next verse might be a little challenging for some of you. As I heard some rattling around in the tent this morning. It says, very early in the morning. Now, let, let me go on here. I know we're feeling some feelings. While it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon, one of his companions, went to look for him. And when he found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. See, everyone wanted a piece of Jesus. See, what made Jesus such a great warrior on earth is he had such an incredible walk with his God. Let's examine his walk here. It says, very early in the morning, he left the house, and then he went off to a solitary place. He had a war room. He had a spot. He had to have a spot. Amen. We'll talk about that here in a moment. All right. Number four, he worshiped God. He didn't have these like mamsy pamsy prayers. He cried out to God, as Hebrews says, with loud cries and tears. And number five, once he was charged, once he was prepared, he proclaimed the word of God. Nice. Some of you might say, that, that's, that's all fine, Jason. But Jesus didn't take 12 units of classes. <laughs> Jesus didn't have a secular job like me. Jesus didn't have the responsibility. Had, you know, Jesus wasn't the full-time ministry, amen? amen? We'll look in verse 32. Let's take a look at Jesus' schedule. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon-possessed. What does that say there? The whole what? The whole town. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He drove out many demons, but would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Jesus prioritized his walk with God as number one in his life. Yeah. See, Jesus was, yes, a warrior. And it's fun to think about that, amen? Like, he's a warrior. He had the sword. But here, we even see another side of Jesus. We see a gentle side. He healed people. He healed the heart. He healed the diseases. Wow. He saved people. He took time to put a special touch on each person he came across. That's right, Jason. That's a great point, bro. You know, the Bible teaches in Luke, when Jesus performed miracles and healed, what came out from him? Power. Power. Therefore, every time he healed someone, what happens? He was more tired and more tired. After sunset, the whole town. That's a lot of people, amen? Yeah. You know, some of you feel burned out today. Some of you are coming to this street with your hand barely making out on kind of the, the threshold of the floor. And you're tired, you're frustrated, you're bitter, you're critical. You know why you're burnt out? Because in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus, I'll give you rest. You're not yet coming to Jesus. Come on, Jason. See, we got to experience daily preparation. And we need to come to Jesus. You know, I love preaching about quiet times. I love preaching about quiet times. This brother in Dallas comes to me, bro, why do you talk so much about quiet times? Well, bro, because it's that important. Come on, bro. Because it's that important. Come on, Jason. You know, it's so awesome having quiet times. I understand we have brothers and sisters all over the movement having quiet times. Yeah. You know, even in Chennai, India. Yeah. There's brothers and sisters out there, man. Amen. You know, at the beginning of the year, our church in India was going through some very challenging times. <coughs> they hadn't seen growth in a while, and they started to experience many followers. So Raja Razan, the church leader, he pulls the church together in the first week of February. And he said, guys, it's time to get back to our first love. Mm -hmm. Guys, it's time to start getting our daily preparation in once again. It's time to fast like never before. It's time to pray but." More than ever before. Amen. It's time to cry out to your God like never before. Yeah. You know, they repented. And in the 28 days of February, God gave them 28 additions, 24 baptisms, and four restorations. Yeah. Are you walking with God? Are you walking with your maker? Are you merely having a checklist quiet time just in case someone asks you what you read 
Come on, Jason. How do you have a great quiet time? Well, I'm going to tell you. It's called the seven-step quiet time. Number one, you got to wake up early. I want to challenge you to buy an alarm clock. Richie McDonald came down to, to Dallas last year and challenged us that. It changed my life. Not, not just your phone. You hit snooze too easy. Get an alarm clock and put it like 10 or 12 feet away from your bed. And watch out for that snooze button. I like to imagine like there's demons there with like a bow and arrow and they're like hitting me to hit the snooze button every day. The snooze button's a dangerous thing. But you got to wake up early. Secondly, you got to go outside and find your spot. You can't have a good quiet time with people zipping around your house. You know, maybe you're like my wife and you make a war room in the closet, but then make it awesome. But you need a spot. Thirdly, you got to sing. How do you sing? You sing with your whole heart before God. It was awesome in the morning. Caesar and me got to sing on his balcony. I think a few birds may have fell from the sky and <laughs> the police were called, but we sang with all our hearts. Number four, you got to pray. You know, I was bitter last week and I prayed for an hour, woke up at five and I prayed till 545. It took me 45 minutes for my heart to soften. You need to pray until your heart changes every single day. Go, Jason. Number five, you need to read, truly read, not just read the verse of the day, not, not just bust out a holy flip, get in your word and read like never before. Study out the scriptures. Ask your disciple advice from what to read. Read books that inspire you to get deeper in the Bible. Amen? Amen. Six, buy a notebook. <laughs> class is important for you. You have a notebook for class. Yeah. Why not have a notebook for your quiet times? Wow. And number seven, make decisions every day on what you're going to change. Come on. If you don't make a decision to tell someone, you're going to forget about it by lunchtime. Oh. You know, when you're clu truly close to God, when you understand that God is truly all-powerful. You have the heart of King David, who yep. truly walked with God. Amen. Like in 2 Samuel 22, I read for my quiet time today. And verse 2, it says, the Lord is my rock. Verse 20 says, he says, you are my lamp, O Lord. Verse 30, it says, with your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. Amen. And verse 40, it says, you are me with strength for battle. Amen. Do you want to get strength for battle? Yeah. It's time to get strength from God. On, bro. Brothers and sisters, simple challenge. Let's go after walking with God. Let's go after daily preparation. And we can truly imitate our brothers and sisters in India and see if the impossible become a reality in the Pacific Northwest. Amen. Come on, Jason. So we have radical proclamation. We know we need what? Daily what? Preparation. Preparation. And lastly, if we want to be true warriors of Christ, we got to have continual transformation. Nice. Look back up in verse 21 here. Brief story about Jesus. It says, they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Jesus went in the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teachings because he taught as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus, son of Nazareth? Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know that you are the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. I don't know what that sounded like. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. Firstly, what do we see here? People notice something special about Jesus. What do they notice? His confidence. Why was Jesus so confident? Because he had a great walk with his God. You know, when you struggle with confidence, when you, surely no one here struggles with insecurity except me. When you struggle with insecurity, God's out of the picture. That's true. It's time to go on down to the lake. It's time to take 10 minutes. 
go pray and get God back in awesome. the picture so you can Come stick on. your head up high and say, I walk with God. Yeah. You know, I love verse 32. Jesus is the church, and it's good to know Jesus went to church. <laughs> and he's preaching the word, and he's going into it. You should have been there. <laughs> and as he's preaching, this man with a demon inside him speaks up. I don't know what it sounded like. <laughs> My wife loves horror movies there, so I, I picture him. What do you want with us? <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth, have you come to destroy us? I know that you are the Holy One of God. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> and Jesus said sternly, come out of him. And the man was transformed instantly back to normal. You know, that could have been a pretty bad situation. Can you imagine that here? Like, I'm preaching here, and then someone stands up with a demon. They're like, stop preaching. <laughs> We're all going to look at Joel and be like, what do we do? <laughs> this, this is not good. Joel, are you going to tackle him? Like, what's going on here? Where's Eric? <laughs> Why was Jesus able to have such great transformation? You need to understand, it's all a matter of faith. You see, if you have zero faith, that situation, you say, man, this is a problem. There's a demon-possessed man here. Oh, my gosh, this is scary. I'm going to go hide in my tent, go under my blankie. <laughs> if you have a little bit of faith, this is a challenge. Oh, my gosh, I'm just ticked off. Church is ruined. Hey, man, it's not that bad, but th this is just a challenging time. But if you have great faith, you say, "Woo, howdy. howdy. <laughs> we got us here an opportunity to wrangle down for the Lord. <laughs> You see, there was great transformation because Jesus didn't see a problem. He didn't see a challenge. He saw an opportunity. You see, Jesus had great faith and he brought continual transformation. You know, December 20th, 2016 was the greatest day of my life. First day was my baptism. And the second greatest day is the day I got to marry my beautiful bride. Come on, you know, it was incredible. We got married, and less than 12 days later, we were sent on the mission field. Wow. Sent from Los Angeles down, down to, to be the campus ministry leaders in, in Dallas-Fort Worth. And I was ready to, we're going in the ministry. I was just married. We're going to take on the world. We're going to baptize some cowboys. We're going to baptize, I'm going to get some boots. We're going to baptize everyone and their cousin. We're going to be flat cranking. <laughs> and I get to Dallas expecting this crazy campus. I mean, I'm going to the ministry here. This is going to be incredible. They, they got an incredible group waiting for me. <laughs> As you say in Australia, I was struggling. <laughs> there was three guys. One of them fell away, one of them got sent to a different ministry, and one of them started dating and moved to a different church. Struggling. I had a little bit of faith, you know, God can still possibly kind of maybe finagle some people in the kingdom here. Sadly, we, we didn't crank for a long time. But I tanked. There's no transformation going on. That led to self-pity. Led to discouragement. Led to a deep-rooted insecurity on how people viewed me. I was focused on people. Come on, Jason. I could tell you how every single problem in my life was someone else's fault. Oh, it's my disciples' fault. It's my wife's fault. It's LA's fault. Why'd they send me here? It's this brother's fault. It's this guy's fault that I have no people. It's this person's fault. Come on, bro. The ministry wasn't moving. My young marriage was hurting. And I was even considering walking away from my calling and quitting the full-time ministry. After many talks and prayers, my little faith began to grow. <laughs> and then I realized something. It's not about me. Yeah. It's never about me cranking. 
was never about me doing anything great. It was never about me preaching or sounding awesome or going to baptize a bunch of people. It's all about God. It's all about us bringing glory to God. That's why I was baptized. When, when Caesar baptized me in 2011, that was my conviction. That it's all about God. You know, God, God's got some humor, I believe. Because when you really repent, you start having a radical proclamation. You start sharing your faith. And the person that gets baptized, you don't even reach out to. <laughs> so this sister named Lena reaches out to this, her friend named Bob. I study with them, and then Bob gets baptized. <laughs> Bob reaches out to his brother Christian, and then Christian gets baptized. <laughs> Christian reaches out to Nathan, and Nathan gets baptized. I'm still sharing. No one's getting baptized. <laughs> Someone else, re- the brother that moved in for ministry, reaches out to Cervante, and then he gets baptized. <laughs> then finally, I got to meet this young man named Jay from the Mainline Church of Christ, and Jay joins us. Yeah. Then Jay reaches out to Jose, and Jose gets baptized. <laughs> Jose reaches out to Calvin, and then Calvin gets baptized into Christ. So then Liam gets baptized. Ben gets baptized, and this last week, Matthew was baptized into Christ. Any situation can transform. It's all a matter of our faith and our creator. What situation do you lack faith to see transformed in your life? What situation don't you believe can change? What Bible study don't you think can become a disciple? What disciple don't you think can change that you're trying to help? Come on, Jason. What sin in your life do you feel you can't overcome? See, we fail to have continual transformation because we fail to have great faith. As of today, there's 84 days left in this year. Come on. That's 84 days to transform. That's 84 days to be a completely new warrior before 2018. Come on. Come on, Consider the past nine months. What sins have been preventing you from experiencing continual transformation in your life and ministry? Is it your purity? Lust? Masturbation and pornography? Is it some sort of hidden sin? Some sort of intoxication or alcohol? How about laziness, where you're just not going out and really preaching the word and sharing your faith? Come on, Jason. Pride and arrogance, where you feel like you've arrived mm. and you don't got to go any further. Mm. Maybe like me, it was self-pity and discouragement. Mm. Whatever it is, whether if I said it or not, I challenge you, write it down. Mm. You know what it is. You know what that sin is. Write it down. Mm. I want to challenge you, number one, get open about it today. Number two, get advice about it. And let's make a decision to completely overcome this faith-killing sin. Come on, bro. You know, when I think of a ministry who, who's truly had incredible transformation, I think back to our Inland Empire days in the Inland Empire region, our L.A. church. You know, a brother named Colton Rome started out the region, and uh, Caesar and Courtney were actually on the original mission team. Joel was the third leader of the Inland Empire region there. And Debbie and Monique were baptized in the IA region. And we got to give them some credit. Brian was kind of in the IE for a bit as he placed membership getting ready for Boston for a month. So we'll (laughs) let Brian be part of the IE there. (laughs) But I want to tell you about the Dark Ages. It's a special place in our hearts. (laughs) It's a magical place (laughs) that we treasure. On opposite day. <laughs> it was a dark time in the campus ministry. I believe Caesar was leading at that time. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Caesar. Let's go, Caesar. There was 13 people, and 12 people showed up to the campus house church. Then we had a, some songs, amen. There was a welcome and prayer. It's always good to have a prayer at church. And then came time for, was it the sermon next or the, the communion? It was a dark time. <laughs> we had communion next, and this was the best part of the service. Actually, I think it was the sermon first. 
This brother comes up. I'm not going to tell you his name. He gets his Bible. Hey, guys, my sermon's in the book of Acts today. He literally reads like four chapters in the book of Acts in a monotone voice. Oh, no. Sees me looking at each other the whole time like, oh. I don't know if this is the dark ages yet, but this is pretty dark. <laughs> so Caesar looks around and realizes, I, I need to do something great to get these people fired up. Come on, Caesar. So the best part of the service, Debbie does an incredible communion. And then Caesar's like, they're just still not fired up after that. <laughs> the singing's terrible. I have a saxophone in my room. Oh, <laughs> we were meeting in his house. We were at his house. I haven't played in 10 years. I haven't warmed up. I don't know. How do I? This is going to be incredible. I think I can still read music. What song was it? I need your love. I, so he gets out, I need your love. <laughs> <laughs> You should have been there. And then I, th it was like a week after I got accepted in ICCM. So I was like on fire for God, listening to all these, these sermons by Kip. And I'm doing contribution. I'm ready to call down fire from heaven. <laughs> You're going to hell if you don't give today. <laughs> oh, like it was intense. <laughs> Seizure just looks at me like. <laughs> it was the dark ages, amen. We weren't very fruitful. We weren't very effective. Caesar had a little fun, but we weren't having too much fun. And there was a lot of sins that we didn't repent of. It was a group that was barely surviving. But after a while, God began to transform that group. Because we understand it wasn't about our talents. It wasn't about who we are or our, our instrument skills. It wasn't about our zeal, about knowledge and acting like a derelict during contribution. It wasn't about us. It was all about God. And God's taken that tiny group of 13 would-be disciples and sent leaders all around the world. You know, he, he baptized in that region, Rebecca Rico, he's, who's a woman's ministry leader in London. A sister named Cassidy, who's a woman's ministry leader in Paris. Marquesa Hill, who was a missionary in Nigeria. Miguel and Myrna, who are missionaries still in Mexico. Garrett, who's a sector leader in the Orange County region in LA. Richard and Valeria, who are missionaries in Portland. And our brother Adam Zapeta, who's an evangelist in Los Angeles now. We understand when we repent, the impossible becomes a reality, and we're going to see continual transformation and see miracles like never before. I pray that this weekend, brothers and sisters, you're not ready to just be fired up, but to go be true warriors for Christ. To go back to your camp and say, hey, it's time not just to share my faith, but to have radical proclamation. Not just to have a little checklist quiet times but to have daily preparation come on bro and not just to repent and confess here and there but to truly have continual transformation you know if you take the m from somewhere in that word proclamation <laughs> if you take the e from somewhere in that word preparation and if you take the T and the A from somewhere in continual transformation. What does that spell? The name of your new campus ministry, META! <laughs> Brothers and sisters, let's be the META campus ministries and transform our campuses for Christ! Yeah.